Thank you for this introduction. Um, yeah, so um, what I want to do in this lecture and um, in this very interdisciplinary context of the CAPA Center is to give a presentation of the discipline of critical security studies and um, its approach to apocalypse, um, whereby you, of course, have to know that critical security studies is itself already um, an interdisciplinary group of scholars from sociology, uh, political science, anthropology, and geography. So um, I want to situate the apocalypse epistemologically within the conceptual landscape of anticipatory security governance, notions like risk, precaution, preemption, preparedness, resilience, catastrophe, which have been one of the key contributions of uh, critical security studies, especially in its first phase. And there are two key moments for critical security studies. One is um, the end of the Cold War, and the other is 9-11. And then I want to briefly um, look at this question of uh, do we live in an Anthropocene or Capitalocene? And um, this equation that is made sort of between financial capitalism and apocalyptic security. And of course, this, all of this is, of course, um, work in progress. So uh, the first moment is the end of the Cold War, and it, pre it presented an identity crisis for the discipline of international relations. So up until then, international relations was basically characterized by a sort of antagonistic struggle between the realist notion of national security and the liberal notion of collective security, where realism said there is only states in a system of anarchy, and liberalism said um, had a more positive sort of um, outlook and the possibility of cooperation in multilateral organizations. But both of them had a state centric notion of security, and neither could account for, um, for the end of the Cold War. So the first uh, the first thing that happened was the so-called widening debate, which tried to redefine security along new reference objects from human security, societal security, environmental security. But it didn't really get very far in disciplinary terms, and it fell short on two grounds. First of all, it didn't actually question the meaning of security itself and only applied it to, to new reference objects. And the problem here was, first of all, as Ulla Weber argued, where do we stop? If we include anything that's good or desirable, then there's no longer any meaningful signification of security. And the second problem pointed out was that all these alternative security notions were still conceived in opposition to a clear-cut, uncontested notion of the state, instead of questioning whether the state really functions as this transcendental um, unit of power. And so two analytics um, following on from these critiques offered a critique of security that remained able to account for the actual operation of power. So the first is securitization theory, which is also called the Copenhagen School, and the second is the biopolitics of security approach, which is also called the Paris School. There was also a third approach, a Frankfurt School-inspired Aberystwyth School, which believed that security was emancipation, and true security could only be emancipatory. But it was also the least influential because it was most closely related to the widening debate notion of security. In contrast, both the Copenhagen and the Paris School see security as self-referential, so not referring to an external objective security or insecurity condition, but establishing a security situation by itself through discourse. So the key work in securitization theory was security, a new framework for analysis, and it tried to both account for the 
historical, historically established discourse of realism, but at the same time criticize it through a notion of security as performative. So drawing on um, performative theory of uh, Austin, securitization was argued to be a perform performative speech act that transforms a social phenomenon into a security problem and thereby mobilizes governmental responses of existential threat, the sovereign exception. It's dependent on being named, being uttered by security elites. So in a sense, it depended on authority or positions of authority. But it wasn't necessary, I mean, it also depended on being accepted by an audience. And this was not a necessary um, event. It could also not be accepted and then the securitization would fail. But securitizations were depoliticizing in the sense that they implied a logic of necessity, they narrowed choice, and they empowered elite. The second analytical approach, the biopolitics, contests contest this foundational nature of a logic of exception or condition of emergency, where normality is suspended for security, and instead they stress the normal, everyday management of unease by professionals of security from the military to police to private security experts. So this approach, which was very much influenced by Foucault and the translation of the Collège de France lectures into English in the early 2000s, so uh, placed the focus from the sovereign to political rationalities and security dispositives and practices instead of utterances of security speech acts. So instead of a sovereign, sovereign power and ruling is territorial subjects, the object of biopolitics was the population. And by taking species life, life itself, as the, what is to be governed by liberal governmentality, uh, the, the logic of governance was that of economy. So the guiding security problem for liberal government is how do we separate good circulation, economic goods, financial products, skilled workers, passengers, social media communication, from bad circulation, viruses, terrorists, terrorist funds, toxic assets, pollution. How can circulation be secured without collapsing circulation as such? And the answer is through risk, because risk as the normal distribution was analyzed as a tool to govern the population. It was both what drives circulation, but also what secures against its adverse effects, because based on the normal distribution, we can make predictions about how the future will develop and thereby we can specify the premiums which need to be raised for insurance. So interestingly, this actually has a lot more to do with the financial notion of securitization, but this is not, um, this is not something that was discussed in the literature. Um, so insurance was seen as that which allows most people most of the time to survive the contingency of the world, putting people and things back into circulation. And on the one hand, this literature was influenced by um, Beck's Risk Society, which had argued that with modernization and then later globalization, modernization risks had become so pervasive and incalculable that they were neither insurable nor governable. They take over the notion that risks are incalculable, but they contest that they are ungovernable because it's precisely through new notions of the future via catastrophe, catastrophe risk, tail risk, radical uncertainty, that new logics of anticipatory governance are rationalized. And this brings me to the second key moment for critical security studies, which was 9-11. So this moment is um, very much characterized by two well-known quotes, the first of which is basically the epistemic rationale for the war on terror, which is Donald Rumsfeld's uh, poem of there are known knowns, there are things we know we know, we also know there are known unknowns, that is to say we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns, there are things we do not know we don't know. 
and George Bush, if we wait for threats to fully materialize, we will have waited too long. We must take the battle to the enemy, disrupt his plans, confront the worst threats before they emerge. In the world we have entered, the only path to safety is the path to action, and this nation will act. So preemption stresses the urgency of political action in the absence of evidence, where the possibility of serious and irreversible damage is deemed intolerable. And this um, underpinned the 2003 invasion of Iraq and um, uh, terrorist uh, politics more generally. Now, um, to characterize preemption a little bit further, it's a different response to decision making under catastrophic risk, which existed, of course, also during the Cold War, because the Cold War, of course, was overshadowed by the prospect of nuclear annihilation. But as uh, Melinda Cooper has argued, this catastrophic risk of nuclear attack was paradoxically ensured against by the principle of mutually assured destruction based on a game theoretical notion of rational actors because such actors deemed such an attack irrational and not in their self-interest. So in a sense, the balance of power in a bipolar world was a balance of terror and mutual deterrence was possible because those two agents shared the same sense of utility, the security of the nation state. And so um, this, this balance being gone, um, the war on terror resor resorted to a, a fundamentally different decision-making approach. But the other distinction that needs to be made, I think, is from the ontology of precaution. Now, precaution also evolved um, around the end, well, it's probably already in the environmental crisis of the 80s and 90s, but it was formalized as a legal principle by the Kyoto Protocol and also specifies a duty to undertake collective preventative action in the face of the unforeseeable future. It also advocates action based on epistemic uncertainty, but here uncertainty is merely a lack of information in an objectively knowable world. There is still um, the possibility uh, and ability to assess threats empirically and identify their causes, and there is also still the belief that the threats might be avoided or mitigated through improved knowledge. We just need to hold on and wait till we have better knowledge. But at the same time, it's also a different approach to action because while the uncertain future sort of halts innovation, you know, let's wait and see, um, preemption seeks to precisely mobilize innovation because, uh, another quote from Melinda Cooper, the only way to survive the future is to become immersed in its conditions of emergence to the point of actualizing it ourselves. Or Brian Masumi, the call, there's a call for action in the present to make the enemy emerge from the state of potential and take actual shape to which the state can respond to. But shortly after, the doctrine of preemption gave way more and more to the, the paradigm of resilience, which follows from a growing acceptance that crisis, while unpredictable, is also inevitable. And the focus shifts from trying to prevent or preempt it to the modes of survival that are necessary. Resilience has become a stable security response to terrorism, natural disasters, pandemics, climate change, problems of critical infrastructure protection, crisis management across any kind of system. It signifies a dynamic capacity of materials, ecosystems, and individuals to withstand stress and bounce back after shock or transition to a new equilibrium. And the crucial requirement here is precisely not the capacity to predict the future, but the qualitative capacity to absorb events in whatever unexpected form they come. So resilience challenges the very idea of central steering, top-down control and prediction. It creates the political subject of homo adaptivos, whose ways of knowing and engaging with the world are always bound by a particular context. But interestingly, as a very influential piece by, again, Melinda, Walker and, uh, Melinda Cooper and Jeremy Walker has pointed out, 
uh, resilience actually moved from being a critique of um, orthodox resource economics to a functionalist idiom of global governance. So, um, based on the uh, eco systems ecology of Crawford Holling, um, they uh, point out that, or Holling pointed out already in the 70s, that it's the very expectation of a maximum yield from renewable resources that so changes the deterministic conditions that the resilience of a system is lost or reduced, so that then a chance and rare event that previously could have been absorbed can trigger a sudden dramatic change and loss of structural integrity of the system. So in this paradigm, the, long, the very long-term expectation of stability is inherently destabilizing. And uh, th this was also um, foreshadowed by Luhmann's uh, system theory, who says, almost by definition, complex systems internalize and neutralize all external challenges to their existence, transforming perturbation into an endogenous feature of the system and catalyst to further self-differentiation. So this poses a monumental challenge to social critique, because the system cannot be criticized from within the terms of complexity, and it questions the very distinction between the inside and outside of closed systems. And one, um, one further aspect of, of uh, this paradigm of resilience from a, a piece of Delft Water is that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change acknowledges that given the degree of global warming that is already inevitable, massive adaptation efforts are required to prevent catastrophic impacts upon vulnerable regions worldwide. However, due to the uniqueness of every vulnerable community, as well as the unpredictability of local impacts, centrally organized forms of adaptation are deemed neither possible nor indeed desirable. Only the vulnerable communities themselves would possess the appropriate forms of tacit knowledge required for successful adaptation. In particular, indigenous populations have been identified as promising agents of adaptation policies and resilience pro programming due to their perceived embeddedness into their surrounding ecosystems. So to sum up the anticipatory security landscape, Anticipatory security governance fundamentally relies on the imagination, creative capabilities, and bodily and tacit knowledge to respond and adapt to inevitable crisis. Preemption blurs the difference between real and imagined threats. Threat is emergent, preemptive power incitatory. Plausible futures are no longer probabilistic, the continuation of the past, but scenarios are evocative. And with the par paradigm of resilience, Security, the imaginary of security has gone entirely ecological and relies on heterogeneity and plural knowledges. So this is a radical new epistemology and ontology of the future and has led to a number of um, more specific epistemic alternatives of how we know the future. So first of all, scenario planning um, instead of uh, the tyranny of the past, which is associated with probability, seeks to counter the unknown by means of the imagination, both as a basis for threat simulation and stress testing. Um, these are plausible narrative accounts of the future, and while not claiming the precision of risk assessments, they nonetheless seek to legitimize decision making on the basis of their emotional salience and an appropriate number of possible futures. The future is not a question of distance and time, but what radically differs from the present. Another alternative is uh, threat enactment, so exercises of threat enactment and preparedness, which try to um, grow the experiential knowledge of its participants. So the use of the creative capacities of embodiment, and um, these are also based on scenarios that are supposed to be realistic and prepare a sort of reactive capacity um, while not expecting future threats to materialize exactly as in the, in the um, narrated scenario. And finally, political prediction markers, they try to, um, to, mo to mobilize the 
the capacity of the market to collectively predict the future. So shortly after 9-11, there was a terrorism futures markets proposed by the Pentagon, which didn't go through, but it exemplifies this um, idea that the market, this is a Hayekian argument, um, and it, it's actually very close to the resilience argument that only market participants in their own context and their own local tacit knowledge you know, are able to, um, to uh, provide the optimal um, assessment of the future collectively. But more recently, we have come to realize that we have entered yet another uh, period, and that is the Anthropocene. The first time in human history that human action is seen to have irreversibly affected the biosphere, geology, and ecosystems of the planet. And as Metman and Rote point out, um, there is a certain paradox, uh, at least uh, in the initial phase of it, that even though there is clearly a securitization of climate change um, in existential terms, it didn't result in exceptional or extraordinary measures. But instead, uh, what was put forth were piecemeal and technocratic solutions um, associated with risk management. So the, the reason or the, the, the argument they give is that even though the master, th well, it's because there's a master threat that coincides with the limits of humanity and so constitutes humanity as a homogenous social space that it can be governed as a world population according to the logic of risk. And as they argue, it's the very impossibility of knowing the systematic lack of knowledge in the face of the apocalypse that actually enables particular dispositives of risk. And the paradox that they point out is the, that the greater and more apocalyptic the perceived threat, the greater the resulting distrust in political actors and exceptional measures, and therefore the smaller and technocratic the political measures. So securitization is here so exaggerated that it prompts the opposite, routine and micro practices of risk management. But more recently, the whole notion of, I mean, I'm not saying they don't criticize the notion of the Anthropocene, but there has been additional critiques of um, the Anthropocene and alternative suggestions as a capitalocene. Um, capitalocene is not the standard left argument that um, unbridled capitalism is apocalyptic. But um, it's saying that there is a new phase of, or that's how I understand that there's a new phase of capitalism which sustains and nurtures apocalyptic imaginaries and for which the management of fear is a central light motif. And here the presentation of climate change as a global humanitarian cause produces a thoroughly depoliticized imaginary. Um, but at the same time, there is a sort of um, equivalence of the speculative economy and the economy of emergence. So this is also um, in part in Melinda Cooper's work where she argues that the war on terror was as much a political response to the downturn of the new economy of the venture capitalism of the early 2000s as to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And she says the only thing that changed between neoliberalism and neoconservatism is, um, is the effective balance of our relation to the future, from euphoria to panic to fear, or rather alertness, a state of fear without foreseeable end. But I, while I'm very sympathetic, of course, to uh, an analysis that make connections between finance and security, because um, Th those sides tend to, people t tend to look only on at one side um, or the other. I, I'm not sure I, um, I really believe that you can equate financial capitalism with apocalyptic insecurity. And I think something that we need to think about is that it is clearly only because of the successful securitization of climate change and the depoliticization that entails. <laughs> 
that there is even a chance of transforming capitalism, as is visible in the emerging debate on the Green Central Bank mandate, for example, which was not driven by elites. But nonetheless, that's where the, the change really needs to happen. So I want to end with a, a slightly different um, uh, proposition, which is called security capitalism. And so um, people have often noted that uh, despite the largest global financial crisis um, in history, nothing has changed really. There's no new epistemic paradigm like Keynes' general theory, which um, followed after the Great Depression. But actually one thing that has changed is the emergence of a new notion of risk that bears no reward, systemic risk. And if Keynes inaugurated a notion of the macroeconomy, the global financial crisis gave rise to macrofinance and macroprudential regulation, stress testing, and an understanding and concern with finance as critical infrastructure that needs to be protected. And here, users made of all the arsenal of anticipatory tools of governance that critical security studies has studied 15 years ago. All of this stuff, precautionary principle, resilience, infrastructure, this is all like what finance is talking about at the moment. So while there is no new economic paradigm, there is a, a superimposition of security onto the financial economy, which amounts to an implicit acknowledge, acknowledgement by governments that markets do not collectively provide the best assessment of the future. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>